If you would, please open your Bibles with me to my dad's favorite chapter in all of God's Word, the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. When I was a kid growing up listening to my dad preach all the time, I've heard him probably at least a hundred times or more preach out of Romans chapter 8. He loved that chapter, and I used to wonder, why, why is he so stuck on, you know, Romans 8? And then as I began to uh, mature and God put me in the ministry and I began to study the Word, I found out exactly why my dad loved Romans 8 so very much. And in a moment, we're going to look at the first six verses in detail, but I just want you to glance through with me as to why I believe now that, uh, that, my, that the eighth chapter of Romans was my dad's favorite uh, chapter in all of God's Word. Uh, look at the ninth verse. You're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Uh, great verse. Look at verse 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And then that great, great verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's, that's a great uh, verse. My dad preached more on the security of the believer than any other subject uh, in the world. He loved to preach on the security of the believer. And he used that verse a lot. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Not that we hope so, hope so, maybe so, think so, but we are the children of God. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that that's true. Then verse 18, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I call that verse from glory to glory. <laughs> There's some gory, th gory things that might happen to us down here on earth, but the glory we'll see in heaven. The gory things are not in any way to be compared with the glory that we'll see when we see the Lord. Verse 24, we're saved by hope. Hope is seen and not hope. Uh, for what a man seeth, that does he yet hope for. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we wait patient for it. Verse 26, here, here's a verse that's quoted many times. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. We know not what we should pray for as we all, but the Spirit itself maketh inner session with us with groanings which cannot be uppered. I've heard Brother Roger quote that verse many, many times. Uh, verse 28, here's a refrigerator verse. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. What shall we say then? Verse 31, to these say, if God be for us, who can be against us? Isn't that a great verse? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall any of these things? No. In all these things, we're more than conquerors. Verse 37, through him that loved us. Verse 38, I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Great, great and precious promises of God's Word in Romans chapter 8. Back to verse 1. And if you, if you need a title, uh, the title is simply, Let's Celebrate Real Freedom. Let's celebrate real. How many of you feel like you're a free citizen of the United States of America? Are you a free citizen of the United States of America? What would free mean? Free would mean you could do whatever you pleased to do, right? So you're, you're not a free citizen because there's some things according to law you cannot do, right? So we're not technically free. What, what, do, we, what do we celebrate every July the 4th? Celebrate freedom. We celebrate freedom, but are we really free? Well, in some ways, we're, we're a lot freer than some folks in other parts of the world. But we're not totally free physically. But the good news is, you can be totally free spiritually. 
So that's why the title of the message is let's celebrate real freedom. Because we're talking about spiritual freedom, not physical pre freedom. Verse 1. There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Let's celebrate real freedom together this morning. So what is real freedom? First of all, it's freedom from condemnation. That's right. Freedom from condemnation. Let me ask you a personal question. Be honest. How many of you have ever sinned in your life? You've ever sinned in your life. How many of you think you, you have a right or, or you should be condemned for that sin? By the way, in some ways, in some ways, we are condemned by our sins of the flesh. Amen? Any of you know what I'm talking about? See, because of my sins in the flesh at one time, it cost me 15 days in the brig and a month's pay fine and uh, busted a stripe in the Navy. That was the consequences of my sin. See, as long as we're in the flesh, how many of you realize sin has consequences? How many of you quit sinning completely? Anybody here reach perfection? Do you know there are some churches that teach that their people can reach perfection? How many of you believe that? Well, if you believe it, you believe a lie. Because as long as we're in this flesh, we're not going to reach perfection as long as we're in this flesh. Why do you think Paul said the flesh warreth against the spirit? Paul himself, now Paul was a pretty good man, wouldn't you say? God used Paul to write two-thirds of the New Testament. I'd say he was a pretty good man. But that same pretty good man wrote and said, the things I do, the things that I should do, I do not. And the things I should not do, I do. This war, there's a war inside this flesh. The flesh warreth against the spirit. Paul said he had a constant war going on in himself between the flesh and the worldly things and the spirit. How many of you know what Paul was talking about? Amen. We all have that war. Amen. We have that war against the flesh that we're battling all the time. And thank God, if, if, we're, if we believe enough and everything, God will bring us through and give us victory in that war. But sometimes that victory is hard to come by. Amen? Sometimes that pull of the flesh is so strong that it's hard to, to, to war in the spirit against that flesh. And sometimes the flesh wins out. It's not, it's not pretty when it happens. It's not nice when it happens, but it happens. But we will have victory over the flesh eventually. Why? Because there is now, therefore now no condemnation. If you, if you happen to have murdered somebody, if you in your lifetime had murdered somebody, how many of you would expect to be condemned for that murder? Would you expect to be condemned? Would you have a right to be condemned if you murdered somebody? Sure. Sure, sure you would. A jury would find you guilty. If there was evidence that you murdered somebody, a jury would find you guilty. And guess what? You would be condemned. 
You would either be condemned to death or you would be condemned to many, many years in prison. You would be under condemnation because of that sin of murder that you committed. But in Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation. Put your thinking cap on. In heaven, in heaven, at the judgment seat of Christ, in heaven, how many of you believe you'll be condemned for the sin you sin down here? You know what? When we come to the judgment seat of Christ, I have a picture in my mind that when we come to the judgment seat of Christ, I believe the devil is going to be present. And I believe the devil is going to try to convince Jesus of all the wrong things that you have ever done in your life. The devil is called the accuser of the brethren, not the accuser of the lost world. He doesn't need to accuse the lost world. They're following right along with him and going to go to hell with him. So he doesn't need to accuse them. But he's called the accuser of the brethren. And he's going to try to accuse you and me of every bad thing we've ever done in all of our life. And when he comes to testify at the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to say, you know, old Mickey Fugit, I remember when he was in the Navy. I remember when he did things that put him in the brig and he did all these evil things and all that. And, and I bring these charges against him. And you know what Jesus, my lawyer, is going to say? I took that sin on the cross. And I declare right now that Mickey Fugit is not condemned. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. To those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I try to the best of my ability every day. I try to walk in the Spirit every day and not walk in the flesh. But that is a continual battle. Amen. I find the flesh is still winning every once in a while. See, I have to admit to you, I'm human. Now, I know some of you think I'm, you know, above, you know, the, the preacher, you know, he, he's above all these things that happen to people and everything. You know, he's got it made. He doesn't pay taxes, you know, and all this stuff that people say about the preacher, you know. But I fight that battle. But I thank God that one of these days that battle is going to be done. That battle is going to be over with. And Jesus is going to say to the devil, Mickey Fugit is not condemned, or whatever my new name is. See, my name in heaven won't be Mickey Fugit. I don't know what it'll be. But in heaven we'll have a new name. You understand that, right? The Bible says we'll have a new name. So I don't know what it is. But anyway, he's going to say, this guy, this guy right here, is not condemned. Because there's therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. So we celebrate real freedom from, from condemnation. We also celebrate real freedom from the law of sin and death. From the law of sin and death. Uh, look at verse 2. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free. We're celebrating freedom. Free from the law of sin and death. See, the law of sin and death, it says, if you have sinned, you deserve death. If you have sinned, you deserve to die. How many of you are going to die? Now, I'm speaking physically now, not spiritually. I understand in the spirit, spiritually, we're never going to die. I understand that. Remember what Jesus told them at the tomb of Lazarus? He that believeth in me shall never die. So if we're saved, born again, children of God, we're not going to technically, we're never going to spiritually die. We're going to die physically, maybe if the Lord tarries. We're going to die physically. But as soon as we, as you've heard me say many, many times before, and I believe it stronger every time I say it, we as Christians, we, when we draw our last earthly breath down here, we'll immediately draw our first breath of heavenly air up there. 2 Corinthians 5, to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I believe with all of my heart, as soon as we draw our last breath down here, we'll draw our first breath of heavenly air up there. So we're free 
We're free from the law of sin and death. We're going to die physically, but we're never going to die spiritually if we're in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So therefore, as Jesus said, we never have to die. We simply change locations. We get promoted from earth to heaven. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I look forward to promotion day. We're going to be promoted from, from earth to heaven, free from the law of sin and death. Also, we celebrate real freedom from walking after the flesh. From walking after the flesh. Oh, for what the law could not do, verse 3. For the, what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, not with, not with sinful flesh. No, because He never sinned. But He came as a man in the likeness, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. The only way sin could be condemned in the flesh was by a man that came in the flesh and lived his life perfectly without sin, and that was only Jesus Christ and nobody else. Condemned sin in the flesh. Condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We are free from walking after the flesh. Now we're going to be in the flesh. We're going to be in the flesh as long as God chooses to leave us here on this earth. But we don't have to walk after the flesh. We don't have to fulfill all of our fleshly desires because we have the spirit of life in Christ Jesus working in and through us. And because we have the Spirit working in and through us, we are not long, no longer condemned by that law of, of, of the flesh, that law of sin and death. We've been delivered. We've been set free from that law of sin and death. We do not have to sin. We do not have to sin, but we do. <laughs> Why do we? Because sometimes we're weak. I heard a preacher say one time, said, the reason we sin is not so much because we're weak in the flesh, it's because we're strong in the flesh. <laughs> Our flesh gets strong and over, overcomes uh, the spirit sometimes, and we, and we sin. Not that we want to, at least I don't want to. Do you want to sin? I mean, if you want to sin, something's wrong with you. You probably need to get saved if you want to sin. You know, saved people don't want to sin, but we do. But we're not, we're free from, the, from walking after the flesh. Fourth and finally, let's celebrate real freedom from being carnally minded. From being carnally minded. What does that mean? Let's look. Look at verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. In other words, all they're concerned about is the flesh. They're not concerned about the spirit at all. Some don't even believe that man is created in the image of God. Isn't that stupid that people can believe that man's not created in the image of God? When it plainly says that in God's word. That's why a lot of people don't understand that the fact that they're going to spend eternity somewhere. Say, how do you know that, Brother Mickey? Let me ask you a question. Does the Bible say God is a spirit? The Bible says God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So God is a spirit, right? Does not the Bible say that God created man in His own image? Well, if God is a spirit and we're created in God's image, what does that make us? Spirit. First and foremost, your spirit. Now, now your earthly suit, your earth suit, your body contains 
the real you contains your spirit. Your spirit is the real you. People look at you and they see different people in different ways because of the way they look. All right? You're judged by a lot of people by the way you look. But God doesn't judge you by the way you look. The Bible says man looketh on the outward appearance. Man's concerned about what they look like, what you look like, what everybody looks like. God's not concerned about that. Man, man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh where? At the heart. Man looketh at the outward experience. God looketh at the heart. And in your heart, you're one of two things. You're either carnally minded in your heart or you're spiritually minded in your heart. If you're carnally minded, all you care about are things of the flesh. It's all you care about. All you care about is whether or not you have food, clothing, shelter, whether or not you've got enough money, whether you've got a nice vehicle, whether you've got a nice house to live in. You're, you're only worried about carnal things because you're carnally minded. But if you're spiritually minded, you're more concerned about the things of the Spirit. You're more concerned about whether or not you're going to heaven or hell. Whether or not you've really trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You are spiritually minded if you care more about the things of the Spirit than you do the things of the flesh. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Listen to this. For to be carnally minded is death. To be carnally minded is death. Now that doesn't just mean the person's going to die physically. That death means an eternal death. That death means an eternal separation from God in a place called hell. H-E-L-L. -L, hell. Now, I know it's not popular to preach hell in this day and time. But Jesus Christ himself talked more about hell than he did about heaven. Check it out. Read through your New Testament. Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. Why? Because Jesus knows hell is real. Jesus knows that people are going to a real hell that do not put their faith and trust in him. They that, are, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for to be carnally minded is death, eternal death. If your mind does not have a change from a carnal mind to a spiritual mind, somewhere along your journey, you're in, you and everybody else that dies with a carnal mind is going to go to hell. But to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. I've shared this with you before, but I traveled this country for five years doing 30 to 36 revival meetings a year all over the country. And as I traveled during those five years, I tried to always pick out somebody in the church and, and try to ask them to share with me their personal testimony. We'd have testimony services every once in a while, you know. Uh, we used to do that a lot more than we do now, you know. But we asked people to give their testimony when they got saved. And people would give their testimony when they came to know the Lord. And there was one, there was one specific thing that was evident in every testimony of anybody I ever heard give of when they came to know the Lord. There was one particular thing that was evident in every one of their testimonies. You know what that thing was? Peace. When they came to the Lord, they experienced peace. You know why? Because when you come to Jesus, there's a peace that passeth all understanding. There's a peace that you cannot define, you cannot explain, but you can experience. And it's that peace that passes all understanding when you come to Jesus. And He relieves you of that burden of lostness. 
And when He relieves you of that burden of lostness, what takes the place of that burden is peace. Life and peace in Jesus. Aren't you glad you know Jesus? See, nobody can know peace outside of the Prince of Peace. And the Prince of Peace is Jesus Christ, God's Son and our Savior. There is therefore now no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. Let's celebrate real freedom. Amen? Let's stand. What are we singing, Brother Roger? 288, where he leads. 188.